Let's take a look at solving polynomial equations that are given to you here. See which of these you know how to solve. Not only that, you could also encounter directions that say find all roots of the polynomial equation, or find x-intercepts of the polynomial function, find zeros of the polynomial function. For the last two, you will have f of x or y equals 10x plus 6, or 10x squared plus 11x minus 6. So all of these directions mean you're doing exactly the same. You're setting the polynomial to zero and figuring it out, and figuring out what the solutions are. You already know how to solve the first two. Then we'll look at how to solve the problem numbers three and four. So let's look at one and two since you know how to solve those. You can see that if you wanted to solve the first equation, which is 10x minus 6, by undoing, that means add 6 and divide by 10, which gives you 6 over 10, or 3 fifths y, reducing the fraction. So once we reduce the fraction, you'll end up with x equals 3 fifths as your solution. What about 10x squared plus 11x minus 6 equals 0? You can either use quadratic formula or factor. If you factor it, it will look like 5x minus 2, 2x plus 3 equals 0. When you solve, you get 5x equals 2, or 2x equals negative 3, or x equals 2 fifths, or x equals negative 3 halves. What is the similarity between problem number 1 and problem number 2? You can see that when you solve in the first one, you have the constant term is the numerator, and the leading coefficient, the highest degree term coefficient, is 10, which is the denominator. In the second one, the leading coefficient is 10, and the constant term is 6. And you can see 2 times 3 is 6, and 5 times 2 is the 10. So what you notice is the denominator for all the real solutions are coming from factors of the leading coefficient. The numerator is coming from the constant term. So if you look at this polynomial, since we don't know any of the solutions here, what should we try? We know that the numerator is going to come from factors of 6. Denominator is going to come from factors of 10. And so if you use Wolfram Alpha or some other graphing utility or computer algebra system, you can even factor and you'll see that the factors are 5x minus 2, 2x plus 3, x plus 1. When you solve, you'll get these solutions. And you can see, again, numerator of all of the solutions come from the constant term. Denominators are factors of the leading coefficient. These observations lead mathematicians to think that there may be something to this. Let's look at number 4. So again, you can see when you factor problem number 4, 5x minus 2 times 2x squared plus 3, x is 2 fifths, or x squared is negative 3 halves, which we can further reduce by taking square roots. You'll get plus or minus square root 3 halves i. So if you look carefully here, again, 2 fifths, numerator is 2, which is a factor of 6 and 5 is a factor of 10. So it is possible that numerator should always be a factor of the constant term. And the denominator is factor of the leading coefficient, which in this case is 10. The only way you get constant term is multiplying each of the factors constant terms together. And the leading coefficient comes from multiplying all the leading terms in each of the factors. We can state the observations that we just made as rational zero's theorem, which will state that if you have a non-constant polynomial function of degree n, that its rational zeros are given by plus or minus p over q. p is the numerator, q is the denominator. The numerator are factors of the constant term, and the denominator are factors of the leading coefficient. And p over q is in simplest form, which means that p and q are reduced. They have no common factors between them. What exactly is the rational zero theorem saying then? All it's saying is that if you take a polynomial function, 
say f of x, which is 3x cubed minus 11x squared minus 19x minus 5, and you want to know where it's exactly equal to 0, then the zeros of that equation are of the form plus or minus p over q, where p is a factor of negative 5, which is the constant term, and q is going to be a factor of 3, which is the leading coefficient. So our possible numerators of the zeros, rational zeros, are plus or minus 1, plus or minus 5, because those are factors of 5. Possible denominators of the rational zeros, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 3. So all possible rational zeros, this function y equals f of x could have are combinations of numerator over denominator. So 1 over 1, 1 over 3, 5 over 1, 5 over 3. Those are all possible numerator denominator combinations you could have, plus or minus. So for example, if you look at negative 1, f of negative 1, you can see it's automatically 0. f of 1 would be 3 minus 11, which would be negative 8 minus 19 minus 5. Clearly, 1 is not going to be a 0. So you can plug in each of those possible rational zeros and actually find all the zeros. In this case, you can check f of 5 is 0 and f of negative 1 third is 0. But f of positive 1 third or f of negative 5, f of 5 thirds and negative 5 thirds are not 0. Now, only really that, once you find the rational zero, since you know degree is 3 and you already found the three zeros, then we can rewrite the polynomial function as a product of these factors. Leading coefficient is 3, so 3 times x minus minus 1, which is x plus 1, x minus 5, and x minus minus 1 third, which is x plus 1 third which in return will allow us to sketch the graph as you recall from previous section. So finding zeros of a polynomial function is important, and the rational zeros theorem is giving us a possible way to look for the rational zeros. That does not guarantee that you will have rational zeros. It's just giving us a way to find the rational zeros if the polynomial had them. So for example, let's take a different example, say 3x cubed plus 4x minus 5. If this polynomial had rational zeros, then the possible numerators would be 1 or 5, plus or minus. Denominator would again be plus or minus 1 or 3. So again, our zeros are plus or minus 1, 1 third, 5, 5 thirds. So if you plug negative 1 in, you'll see negative 3 plus 4 minus 5, which will give us negative 4. f of 1 would be 3 plus 4 minus 5, 7 minus 5, or 2, again, not 0. Try all the other numbers, and you will see none of them work. What that means is that this polynomial has no rational zeros. That does not mean it does not have any zeros. All it's saying is that it does not have any rational zeros, which means it could have irrational zeros or imaginary or complex zeros, non-real zeros. So that we don't know. All we know is that if a polynomial has rational zeros, it has to be one of these numerator-denominator combinations. So how does one go about proving a theorem like that? Well, let's start out with what we know. If you have a polynomial function, and let's say x equals p over q is a rational zero of the polynomial, that means when you substitute p over q for all the x's in the original polynomial, you should end up with zero. So let's see what it looks like then. a sub zero plus a1 times p over q, a2 times p over q bracket squared, and so on, all the way to a sub n p over q to power n, all of that should add up to 0. So if you multiply both sides by q to the power n, look what we got. We got a sub 0 times q to power n. One of the q's on the second term 
will disappear. So you will have A1P times Q to 1 less power, and so on, all the way to the end. A sub n, p to power n, the q to power n on the denominator will cancel out with q to power n that we multiplied by. So if you take a sub n, p to power n on the other side, look what we have. We have that the right-hand side is divisible by p, which means that the left-hand side is divisible by p also. And we already said that the entire coefficients a sub 0 through a sub n do not have any common factors. This shows that since p divides the left-hand side and all of these terms have p except that a sub 0 q to power n, p divides a sub 0. And then on the other side, if you took a sub 0 q to power n to the other side, q divides right-hand side, we can see that since Q is a factor of all the terms except for a sub n p to power n, then Q must be a factor of a sub n, since p and Q also are in reduced terms. Let's recall what we've done when we did division of polynomials. If you have f of x and g of x are polynomial functions, then in the division, f of x divide by g of x. f is called the dividend, g of x is called the divisor. When you do long division and use division algorithm, you can rewrite the numerator function as quotient times the denominator plus the remainder. Remainder is either 0 or the degree of the remainder is smaller than the degree of the denominator. You know remainder is 0 if g of x completely divides f of x. Or in other words here, you can see if remainder is 0, then q of x is actually a factor of f of x, and g of x is a factor of f of x. The remainder theorem says that if you have a polynomial with real coefficients, the remainder of the division f of x by x minus a is given by f of a. What that means is that if you do division and you get remainder to be 0, then x minus a is going to be a factor which we can state as factor theorem, that f of x is a polynomial function, then x minus a is a factor of f of x, if and only if f of a is 0. This is a summary of what we have seen so far. In addition, if you have a polynomial with real coefficients, then all the non-real zeros occur in conjugate pairs, which means if a plus bi is a 0, then a minus bi is a 0. So for example, if 2 plus 3i is given as a 0 of a polynomial with real coefficients, then 2 minus 3i is also a 0 of that polynomial. One of the immediate consequences of this observation is that if you have polynomial function with real coefficients, all complex non-real zeros occur in conjugate pairs. So if you have a polynomial of odd degree, you must have at least one real zero. So an important conclusion of all the things we've done so far is the fundamental theorem of algebra. It says that if you have a polynomial with real or complex coefficients of degree one or more, then f of x has at least one complex zero. The proof of this is more complicated, and you may have to take more math classes if you are curious on why that works. But the proof was generated some 200 years ago by Carl Frederick Gauss. He was a mathematician who proved that all polynomials with real or complex coefficients have at least one complex zero. A consequence of this is the complete factorization theorem, which states that any polynomial can be written as the leading coefficient times linear factors, where each of the factors are its complex roots or complex zeros. So you can take any polynomial and factor it as a times x minus z1, x minus z2, all the way to x minus z sub n. Some of those complex numbers could be repeats, and then you would say the solutions have multiplicity of whatever degree 
pause the video here, see what you can do with these examples from all the things we've studied so far, and let's see what you can come up with. Go ahead, you can do it. If it seems daunting, just take one problem at a time. Don't get stressed out. Remember one thing at a time. Take deep breaths, stay positive, and just attempt. We are going to do it together, but I want you to at least see what you can come up with. Go ahead. You can do it. So we have our first problem, x squared minus 4x plus 1 equals 0 quadratic. So you know how to solve quadratic equations. And so you will use quadratic formula. a is 1, b is negative 4, c is plus 1. So using quadratic formula, we will get 2 plus or minus square root 3. So what that means is we can factor f of x as x minus 2 plus square root 3 and x minus 2 minus square root 3. In terms of the graph, you know it's a parabola. And the x-intercepts are 2 minus square root 3 and 2 plus square root 3. Y coordinate will be 0. The vertex, do you remember how you can complete squares and write it in the vertex form to get the vertex? But right now, you're just concerned about the x-intercepts. It's parabola facing up because the coefficient of x squared is 1, which is a positive number. So in this problem, we already know it's x cubed minus 8, how the graph looks, where 2 as one of its roots. And you can use difference of cubes to factor. The second part is a quadratic, which we can solve. And you'll get negative 1 plus or minus square root 3i. So factors, we have x minus 2 times x minus negative 1 plus square root 3i and negative 1 minus square root 3i. And if you simplify that, you'll have x minus 2, x plus 1 minus 3 square root 3i, and x plus 1 plus square root 3i. In this next problem, we have x to the 4 minus 3x squared minus 4, which we can factor. You can get x squared minus 4, x squared plus 1, x squared minus 4 is difference of squares, so you'll have x minus 2, x plus 2. So when we solve, you will get x is 2 or negative 2, and x equals plus or minus i. So those are all its roots, and you can write it in factored form, and then you can graph. The only thing we do not know is how it behaves at x equals 0. We know it cuts through negative 2 and 2. What we do not know is this, how it turns and comes back up. If you plot a few points, you might see that. But you need to take calculus to see why the shape is what it is down here. We can do factor by grouping. And you can see 2x minus 3 is common. And then x squared minus 2x squared plus 1 factors x squared minus 1, x squared minus 1. Each of those is difference of squares. So our final factors are 2x minus 3, x minus 1 squared, x plus 1 squared. And so we have 1 or negative 1, our multiplicity of 2, and 3 halves is a solution of degree 1. And so if you plot, you already know how to graph polynomial functions. So at 1 and negative 1, you have the graph is second degree. So it will just touch, come back down, again touch, and then cross through 3 halves. So n behavior of the function is like 2x to the fifth. So left hand is on the bottom, right hand is on top. You can see how by factoring, we can see what the zeros are. In the second question, you were asked to find polynomial with real coefficient that satisfies certain conditions. In part a, your leading coefficient was 2, degree of 4, and the zeros. 3 is a 0 of multiplicity 2. So 2 times x minus 3 bracket squared. And then the remaining zeros are x minus 2 plus 5i and x minus 2 minus 5i. So this will give you 2 times x minus 3 bracket squared, x minus 2 minus 5i, x minus 2 plus 5i. You can always multiply the polynomials out to get the final polynomial to see the degree 4 polynomial. So it just needs a lot of patience. But in terms of what to do, once you have the factors, it's just multiplying them out. 
For part B, since the only thing you know is that it's degree 5, you can have any leading coefficient you want, and that will not affect the zeros, and you do not know the multiplicity of the zeros. So one possibility is that x minus 2 thirds to power third, x minus square root 3 minus 2 squared. That will give you degree 5. You could have x minus 2 thirds to the fifth power, x minus, you could have x minus 2 thirds to the fourth power times x minus square root 3 minus 2 to the one power. So you can play around with the powers as long as the total power remains 5, and you can have any leading coefficient you want. In the third problem, you were given a polynomial with real coefficients and degree 11. It's zeros included 3, 5i, minus 2, minus 4i. They asked you to state another zero since all complex zeros occur in conjugate pairs if you have real coefficients. Immediately you know negative 5i, negative 2 plus 4i are also zeros. For part b, since the total number of zeros cannot be more than 11, and at least four of them are non-real, that means at most we can have seven real zeros because there are 11 zeros total. Similarly, for part c, you already know there are 11 total zeros. Only one of them is known to be a real number, which means that leaves you with 10 other potential non-real zeros. So you could potentially have five pairs of conjugates since non-real zeros occur in conjugate pairs. So for part d, negative 8 has to be its leading coefficient. And as long as you have all the zeros and that the degree is 11, you can have whatever you would like. And so clearly the polynomial is not unique. Here are a few examples, and you can make up your own.